So good morning, good afternoon, wherever it is in the world for you right now. Um, for the next 45 minutes or so, what we're going to be talking about is what we mean by qualitative data and particularly what we mean by qualitative data in the context of CCRP. I'm going to use an example throughout today's session, which I'm going to keep coming back to. Um, so apologies for those of you who are not sorghum breeders or sorghum researchers, but this is the example that I've picked. So the motivation that we're going to come back to is that we want to understand the sorghum farmers in our country so that we can understand what varieties they are currently growing, why they're growing those varieties, and what they would value in any new varieties that we might be developing in the future or any new technologies that we might be introducing. Hopefully, if you're not a sorghum breeder or a sorghum researcher, you can map that to your own particular uh, context that you're working in. So to do this, we are good researchers. We think, ah, what we're going to do, we're going to do a survey. So I have written in ODK, a little survey to talk to my uh, sorghum farmers within the country that I'm working in. Please put in Ethiopia or Kenya or Uganda or wherever you're joining us from, insert the name of your country here. So I've got a few questions which I'm gonna ask my sorghum breeders and sorghum uh, farmers, sorry. Uh, what's their name? How old are you? what variety of sorghum are you growing? Is it a, a new variety? Is it a local variety? Uh, what colour are the heads of your sorghum variety? What yield were you getting in the last season? So hopefully fairly typical looking survey questions that you might have seen in the past when you've been doing your own surveys. So what we're actually doing, as you've probably guessed, is we're actually going to do now a meta survey. We're not doing a real survey. I'm now going to ask you which of the questions that I am asking are qualitative questions? What, which of these questions am I going to be getting qualitative data from? And which am I going to be getting quantitative data from? So let's start with question, question A, question number A. So in the chat, maybe if you can put in your own particular thoughts on whether question A would count as a qualitative question. So what is your name? Would this be collecting a qualitative piece of information or a quantitative piece of the information? Okay, so for a question like what is your name? Ah, someone's saying neither qualitative or quantitative, maybe. This is an open variable. It's still a piece of data, um, but it is certainly not a quantitative piece of data. So in this particular instance, yeah, you can say it's, it's certainly not a quantitative piece of data. I will come on to say in a minute whether I would say it's qualitative or something else, but it's, it's not quantitative. What about how old are you? Question, question number B, would this count as a, a quantitative question? So generally, if you see something which is going to be a number, how old are you is an age, it's a number, then it's probably a sensible assumption that it's going to be quantitative. There might be issues around this question. Maybe not everybody knows exactly their age. Maybe not everybody knows um, exactly... Um, to the, if, if they've got confused with their birthday, if they're answering on behalf of their other family members or their neighbours, in some cases, you can ask how old people are and you don't necessarily get the right answer. But it's still a quantity, it's a number, so we generally call that a quantitative type question. Okay, question, question number C. The main variety of sorghum grown in the last season, 2016 to 2017, Although I might need to update this because this is maybe two seasons ago now. Whether it was a new variety or a local variety. So in this case, I would probably argue that it's more qualitative than quantitative. But thinking of it as a qualitative 
bit of data is maybe not so useful. This is a what I would call more a categorical variable than a qualitative variable. If you want to call it a qualitative bit of data, you probably can, but it's n again not a quantitative piece of data when we're saying what is the variety being grown. Okay, what color is the sorghum? Is it red, brown, green, yellow, gray, or something else? This is maybe more typical of the sort of qualitative data that you are most commonly familiar with asking data about how things look, um, appearance, um, where we're saying red, brown, green, these are all qualities if you like. So it's kind of easy to see this as a qualitative piece of data. Whether you say Ah, okay, so there's an interesting quest, uh, point made by Zed that you can't measure it with a number. You actually can measure color with numbers. If you do um, <laughs> the sort of, I forget what the exact word is, but if you put the color into Photoshop and you click identify color, you can get what's called a hexadecimal number and that will identify the color with a number if you really want to. Um, but generally we wouldn't necessarily think of color as something which is a quantity we would think of color as something which is a quality okay final question question number e so approximate yield of the sorghum variety so with this most people would probably think ah yes this is a quantitative piece of data but again this is not something we have necessarily measured because we're saying it's a survey, we're asking the farmer to recall that what they yielded in the previous season. So this isn't something that we've measured, we're asking some a farmer to recall this. So it is a quantitative piece of data, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's something which we have measured or counted. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily objective. What it means is it's a number, essentially, more than anything else in terms of quantitative data being more reliable or more valid than a qualitative piece of data. Okay, I have even more questions. So question number F, I like to confuse you by using letters for numbers. Uh, the sorghum crops, were they infected with grey leaf spot in the 2016-2017 season? Yes or no? Simple question. In this case, this is what we would probably call a binary variable. You can argue endlessly whether this is a um, qualitative or quantitative when it's binary. To me, it doesn't really matter um, because you can say, ah, yes, this is something you can you can measure that whether they have gray leaf spot or not. So you can quantify if they have gray leaf spot or not. But the options you're giving it are not numbers. They're yes and no. Um, in this case, you can argue this in either direction as to whether this counts as quantitative or qualitative. Question number G, almost getting there to the end. So for question number G, similar perhaps to D in terms of what traits do you select when, look for when selecting which sorghum variety to grow, high yielding, low cost, good taste, disease resistance, early maturity, uh, get a better sale price, things looking nice when you harvest them. For a question like this, again, we're dealing with opinions and qualities and traits. These are the sort of questions which you're most familiar with in terms of qualitative type questions, I think. I won't spend too much time on that one because this is maybe a more familiar type question. Uh, question H, I think, is a more interesting one. On a scale of zero to 100, where zero is the worst and 100 is the best, what score do you give your current variety of sorghum? Would this be quantitative or qualitative? For giving something a score out of 100. So for me, this still counts as quantitative. It's completely arbitrary to some extent in terms of how I defined my scale. This isn't like yield where um, this is a, a measurable quantity, but this is a number between zero and 100. Could be a quantity, 
but if you ask me to do this now and you ask me to give you this um this assessment right now and i say oh i rate this 80 out of 100 you're not necessarily going to get the same answer from me tomorrow or next week or in two weeks time because how i might respond to this question could change uh, depending on my mood depending on how well my sorghum has performed over the past two weeks depending on what i had for breakfast what how nice the interviewer was this isn't a question like yield where there is an element of recall bias in yield but there is a number which was the yield that i got last season there is not a singular number which is this sorghum varieties score out of 100 this is uh, a subjective number but i would still say this is a quantitative piece of data and then the final one explaining why i've given the reasons this is then saying you can write whatever you like in this box explain the reasons why you're giving it a score of 80 out of 100 and this is perhaps again another familiar example of a qualitative type data and there is actually very little difference between question g and question i in terms of what kind of question is being asked question g could easily be reworded as explain what traits you look for when selecting which variety of sorghum to grow and left as an open-ended question and equally question i could then have some options given for it of ah okay so here are the reasons probably similar reasons given for uh, tick boxes both of these are qualitative variables one of them question g we have pre-coded some options we thought about what answers are people likely to give to this question and we've come up with some options for question i we've left it completely open-ended they can say whatever they like when you are doing say a survey you will save yourself a lot of time if you think about doing this pre-coding in advance of what common answers are likely to come up because if you want if you're doing a survey of 100 farmers 200 farmers 400 farmers to make any sense of 400 lots of open-ended responses like you would get in question i you will then need to be doing post coding of going through and picking out the common answers and picking out the common themes which come through and that takes much longer than coding in advance however it's always a good idea like we have in in question d but we don't have in question g is to have the option which is other because we can think of as many possible options as we can think of for answers but we still might want to then come in and say ah or someone might come in and say ah, none of these options apply to me something else is the is the answer that i'm think for the traits that i select uh, we had a very good example when i was working in in ethiopia last week on some survey data where someone came in with a very unexpected answer to some of these questions which were being asked in the survey and if we hadn't allowed for people to have an other option then we wouldn't have been able to uh, count for that in the data because we're forcing people to select options which maybe are not the options that we want so there is a balance between question g where we give them options and no other and question i where we just let them write anything that they like so a couple of people in the chat have mentioned two other kinds of data so ordinal data and categorical data both of those things would fall generally under the category of qualitative data so when people talk about categorical data when i talk about categorical data I generally mean things like question D or question G, where we are collecting 
qualitative data from a survey or from an experiment where we have categories coded. So for question G and question D, I would call these categorical data. For ordinal data, that's often where you have a, uh, not quite necessarily the scale of zero to 100, but often the questions like, do you agree, strongly agree, strongly disagree? Where you have some options, but there is a, a defined order. So they are still categories, but you're asked to say, do you strongly disagree, disagree, agree, or strongly agree? So that would again be largely qualitative type data. Overall, the point that I'm making with this exercise so far is that when we talk about qualitative data and quantitative data, qualitative data is not just data about qualities. Quantitative data does not just count as countable things and measurable things. Both of these terminologies, qualitative data and quantitative data, there's lots of different things that exist within there. There's lots of people who like to use the term qualitative data and quantitative data in very, very general terms. And it often makes things confusing and not very useful. It's better to just think in terms of, is this a useful question? What sense can I make of the results from this question? Because if you search for what is qualitative data on the internet, you will get a lot of very bad answers to this question, a lot of oversimplifications to this question. It's not the case that quantitative data is always objective and qualitative data is always subjective. Something like yield theoretically could be objective if we are able to measure it. And if we are able to do a tightly controlled experiment, we know the yield. This is not someone's opinion in terms of the yield. But scoring a variety out of 100 is still counting as a quantitative type data. It's, it's a number, but it's completely subjective. Different people who observe exactly the same thing would rate it differently because based on their own different priorities, based on their own uh, opinions about what they value and what they don't value. Qualitative data can also be objective. Whether or not something has gray leaf spot is objective. What variety is being used is objective. Um, to a certain extent, color can be objective. But when we're dealing with more interesting qualitative data about reasons for using a particular variety, this can be more subjective as well. So the variety is easy to obtain at the market, gives me a good yield, problems with pest and disease, the type of more interesting qualitative data. So the bottom right box here and the examples which are more like question I in my previous survey, these are generally the sort of things that we would get from doing qualitative research. More open-ended questions, things that we're not necessarily getting from surveys, um, things which don't easily fit into a categorical box or things that don't easily fit into a single number. More open-ended types of questions. And when we're talking about qualitative research and qualitative data within the context of CCRP, what we really mean is the type of things which fit into this bottom right box. You can make the arguments that yes, these other things are also types of qualitative data, but that's not the sort of data that we're actually interested in when as CCRP we talk about qualitative data, because how we collect that data and how we analyze that data for variety type or for ticking a box of what traits they're interested in. That is not so different from how we analyze uh, yield data or how we analyze disease data. How we collect and how we analyze the type of data that goes in the bottom right box here is very different and is something which is not being done enough at the moment in terms of fully getting the potential of what 
could happen if there was more qualitative methods taking place. So I'm going to give you two, two examples of some statements which have come from my, my research with my sorghum farmers. So the first one is uh, the data which I've got from doing my, uh, my survey. And this is a statement where I'm trying to now convince people of why the new variety which I'm trying to release to a, a wider group is a good variety. So I'm telling you that the, the average approval rating out of 100 that I got was 74.2 uh, from a group of farmers who are local to you. And the, the local variety only scored an average of 62.1 in the same uh, group of farmers. So we can see there's a huge increase in the average rating for this new variety. And there was even a farmer there who scored this new variety as 100 out of 100 for what they liked. I have an alternative option for how I can present a different sort of results. I can tell the same person that, okay, we spoke to 13 farmers and 11 of them said that they preferred this new variety to the local variety. And there was one farmer who told us that, ah, even though there was bad rains, I obtained higher yields than in the previous season. If you were a researcher trying to publish a paper about why you think this new variety is good, which statement, the first one or the second one, would perhaps be more defensible? Would you be more likely to see in a publication or a report that you were being asked to produce? Let me give you the competing hypothesis or competing question. If you are a farmer, which of the statements is more convincing if you are then trying to um, consider whether you are going to adopt this new variety or not? Yes, so I can see a few people coming in saying that they prefer the second box as a more convincing statement. But there's no, uh, there's no averages, there's no real statistics in that box. Uh, in the first box, we could maybe put in a P, I meant to put in a p-value, and the p-value in the first box is less than 0 0.001. So it's highly statistically significant uh, if you want to put that in. But if I am a farmer, this av difference in average rating, so what? Um, what does that actually mean in real terms that the average is higher? Why are people saying the average is higher? Who are these farmers? Um, in the second box, I'm, I'm getting a bit more of a statement about why someone is preferring it. I'm able to see maybe more explicitly how many people were spoken to and in both cases we're maybe cherry picking an extreme example where i'm saying in the first box oh yes there's one farmer who rated this as 100 out of 100. we can tell from the average scores that there must have been other farmers who were probably scoring this quite low so i have maybe put in a bit of a bias to convince you there that of this uh, the uh, validity of this new variety in the second box, I've pulled out a very positive statement about the new variety. But again, we can see that uh, there's still two farmers in there who, who still prefer their local variety. So maybe we're, we're ignoring those uh, points that those farmers are making. There is validity in both kinds of statement being made here. Just because the second one doesn't contain any p-values or averages or decimal points, doesn't make it less scientifically valid than the first statement. Both of them rely on the methods which were used to collect the data. If we spoke to 13 farmers who we were paying to be part of our research and we were giving them lots of free seeds and we were giving them lots of uh, incentives to be part of the program compared to taking 13 random farmers, if you like, that will heavily bias the kind of results we get in either method. And so while just the numbers themselves can be convincing, we also want to be convinced by the methodologies. And that is applicable to both quantitative and qualitative type 
approaches. We can't just see the idea of qualitative research as an excuse to get biased samples or get um, only involve very small numbers of people who are not representative of wider groups. So there is, there is validity to both of these statements. Generally, what you might see in publications more often is things which are similar to the first type of statement there. But both and the combination of them both can really strengthen uh, our research and our conclusions and our, the way that we're able to convince people of the validity of our results. Okay, we want to round two of uh, what is qualitative data. We had the easy round, which I think I convinced you was confusing and unnecessary. This is now the difficult round, which is actually a little bit more straightforward in a weird sort of way. Okay, what is qualitative data? So I don't think Charles is here, but this is a picture that was taken from the Sorghum project in Uganda. Um, and I really like this picture, which he uh, used in one of his presentations recently. And this is a picture of 26 different sorghum varieties, which was after a um, an on-station trial, and it's an example of them all lined up in a row. Would this picture count as qualitative data? So to me, pictures are an excellent form of qualitative data. This particular picture I think is really useful. They say that a picture can tell a thousand words or whatever the phrase is. If we think about what we can see in this picture, providing we would be able to identify which variety is which, which I believe we can, there's another document which says okay going in order around here at each of the different varieties, Looking at this picture tells us so many things about the color, about the yield, about the size, about the, the length of the stem. So we could have collected about 10 different variables in a data set about each of these 26 varieties. But just looking at the picture, we can see all of that immediately and much more clearly than trying to combine all of these different um, attributes which we could then collect in a data set. So if we were again looking in a, a publication in a paper we could have a really complicated table which explains all of the attributes of the 26 varieties uh, which we visible attributes of the 26 varieties but the picture itself tells all of that information in a much more concise and a much more powerful way. Again, this picture is only useful if we know the context in which it was taken. If this is in a particular location, we wanna know something about the environmental conditions of that location so that we know this is how these varieties performed in a low altitude area with low rainfall and with uh, what kind of fertilizer usage and so on. We want to be able to identify which variety is which. We want to be able to know how long ago this was and so on. But as long as we have all of this metadata about this image, this image and images in general can be a very powerful source of data, which is something that we collect anyway in the course of our projects. I know everybody takes lots of pictures throughout their research but collecting the information about the pictures makes them much more useful and sort of turns the picture into data and into very valuable data. Okay, uh, next example. Again, you might recognize some people in this photo. I think there might be some people on the call who might be able to support themselves here. Uh, this is a image which is the minutes from a meeting of the developments in sorghum technologies between a group of scientific experts. So if you see yourself in the picture, I am calling you a scientific expert. So in this case, 
we're talking about the minutes themselves, so, so the record of the meeting. And this is, I would say, another example of qualitative data, where everything, the discussions that were had within the meeting are another valuable source of data for helping you to make conclusions about your project and helping you to change it, change the way that you are running your project and can feed into any reports that you are making. So it's not a structured survey. It's not anything which came from doing an experiment like in question A here, but the data that was collected through the discussions that you had and through sharing of knowledge is going to help you with your research in the future. So things which are collected without even really thinking about it, like the minutes of a meeting, is also a source of qualitative data. Just to go back to question A, uh, since I saw a comment coming through about how we change the picture into data. I would say the picture is already data. So data is not just numbers and words and um, an Excel spreadsheet. But particularly when we're dealing with qualitative data, it can be much more free form. It can be pictures, it can be reports, it can be drawings that people have done. Data is pretty much anything <laughs> in terms of what it that could potentially be. How it becomes useful is where we have documented where the data came from and what was used to collect this data. And you absolutely could use this picture in a scientific manuscript, as long as you were able to uh, justify where it came from and when it was taken and what, what methods you used to collect the picture. In the same way, you have to justify what methods you used to collect uh, data when you fill it in into an Excel spreadsheet from a survey or an experiment, justifying where you got the pic uh, where you got the picture from in this case it's a very similar process so this is where we talk about metadata the data about the data if you don't have that metadata then it wouldn't be acceptable to just put in this picture into a scientific manuscript because we could have got it from anywhere um, we could have just searched on the internet for pictures of sorghum but if we can justify where we got it from and provide the information about where we get it from, then yes, this is a valuable source of qualitative type data. And the same with minutes from a meeting. Uh, if we just sat in our own room making up an imaginary meeting, then this is not something that we can include in a report. If we have this minutes of the meeting and we were there and we know what happened and there were some very interesting things which came through we maybe might not be able to publish minutes of the meeting um, because there might be issues around data confidentiality of uh, discussions of other people but we can still use the data that we've collected from that meeting to help inform us in the future so qualitative data is not just always going into a scientific research, a scientific manuscript. Collecting and being systematic about collecting data is still useful outside of that context. Notes from focus groups, which were held with some sorghum farmers about what they've been up to in the past season. So focus group discussions. We can see in the picture, I think we've got some Ethiopian farmers you can see some some researchers collecting some notes on the right hand side there the notes themselves and the focus group which is taking place this is something which again is maybe a more familiar form of qualitative research your focus group discussions and your key informant interviews the qualitative data that is being collected here is the field notes and it might be a structured focus group discussion where you have a predefined set of questions that you go through 
and you ask the farmers and maybe you get them to vote at various points. So there might be numbers included within there if, if you're asking people to raise their hands to how many people agree with this statement, how many people agree to this other statement. But the overall notes will be in the form of either a, a recording, if you've been recording the session, or you will have just some scribbles on a bit of pad of paper. When you come to process this data, it won't go immediately into an Excel spreadsheet. You will probably write it up in the form of a transcript, where you will copy all of your notes into a Word file, or if you're using some other word processing uh, software instead of Word, because you're someone like that, go ahead. But this is, again, qualitative data, and this is coming from a qualitative research method. And so next week in the session, we'll be much more focused on how to do good focus groups, how to collect data from focus groups, how to process that data. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this point because that is next week's session. But hopefully that is more familiar as qualitative data, perhaps compared to the first two examples on this page. Final point, question D. Having convinced you now that qualitative data can be more or less anything, what would we think about a sample of soil which we've taken from the farmer's fields? So we've gone to a field and we've decided that we're gonna do a soil sample. And the soil itself, would this count as qualitative data? So if we think of what we're going to do with the soil, we could send it off for chemical analysis. And that chemical analysis will give us, you know, parts per million of the carbon and the phosphorus and the nitrogen and all of this. Equally, we could take a picture of the soil and, and look at the soil and make um, qualitative assessments about the soil. For me, I would call the actual soil itself uh, physical data rather than trying to get it into quantitative or qualitative. It's, it's a bit of a gray area, I'd say. We can collect quantitative data from the soil and we can collect qualitative data from the soil. When you're talking about the soil itself, who knows? Uh, maybe yes, maybe no. I would probably prefer to call it physical data because Unlike a photograph, you can't really put in uh, the actual soil when you're submitting a manuscript. You can include a photograph in a, in a manuscript. You can't give them a sample of your soil and then sp spread that soil around all of the recipients. I think that's possibly going a bit too far. So the soil sample, I would say probably not, but it could be used to generate qualitative data and it could be used to generate quantitative data. So going through this, my general theme running through is that qualitative data can mean lots of different things. And we are particularly interested in examples more like A, B and C on the previous slide when we are talking about qualitative data in the context of CCRP. Because this is coming from qualitative research or it's coming from areas that we are currently neglecting perhaps, as opposed to surveys and experiments. Essentially, qualitative data is anything that might give you insights into your project, which isn't in the form of a number. Quantitative data has a much more clearly defined definition. It's something that's a number. Qualitative data doesn't have such a clearly defined definition. It can cover all manner of different things, as I've been going through over the course of the past half an hour or so. So a question for all of you, have you ever been giving a presentation or been answering questions to your supervisor or to one of your students uh, about your project and you've made some comments relating to observations you've made or conversations that you've had and those are things which are not present within your own data set. So imagine you've been asked to give a presentation about your work and someone's asked you a question you've made a very good comment about, ah, yes, when I was in the, the field, I was speaking to a farmer and he told me that 
the reason why this isn't working so well is because uh, the plot sizes they were using for the experiment were too small, so we weren't able to really measure what we expected. Something along those lines. Those sort of observations or very informative findings that you make, but that they don't fit into a data set. They don't fit into an Excel spreadsheet format for your experiment or an ODK form for your survey or however it is that you're collecting data from your research. What would you do if someone then asked you to provide proof or provide evidence of the statements that you've just been making? That conversation that you had with the farmer or that thing that you saw in the field where you made a very interesting observation about what the farmer was doing that didn't come up in the survey. How would you be able to prove those kind of statements to the extent where you could then include them in a report or in a uh, paper going forward. Because we can't just make baseless uh, comments when we are trying to do this. This is again thinking about the metadata. So every time I go to a um, CCRP research methods meeting or COP, lots of people make really good insights about why things are working or why things are not working or what they would like to see in the future. Often these are made on observations or conversations rather than made through experiments and surveys. And routinely we collect some qualitative data through surveys, through attending meetings. But those sort of observations we make, we have the potential to be turning those observations into data almost constantly because throughout the interactions you're making, throughout the field visits you're making, throughout your day-to-day -day working environment, everything is almost a potential source of qualitative data. So we could add some qualitative methods to our research to formalize the conversations that we might be making with farmers, to have some formal focus groups or key informant interviews or other forms of qualitative research methods. And they'll, we'll be talking more about that in the next few weeks. But equally, we can formalize those observations that we make in our day-to-day -day work. Simply having a notebook to hand at all times, it's almost like being a journalist to a large extent, of being able to record observations where we were, who said it, what was the context, all of this information. If we have evidence, and evidence, it can just be like having a notebook with the conversations written down, date, time, where, when, why. These observations are perfectly valid sources of information. But if we don't write it down, if we don't formalize it in some way, we're then relying on our own memory. And as good as many people's memory is, that doesn't necessarily work in a research context. If you think of a court of law, to a large extent when we're researchers, we're almost being like lawyers trying to argue our case. If someone has a notebook where they've got all the conversations that they've had written down about trying to convict someone for whatever crime they've committed. The, the court of law finds that a much more powerful source of evidence compared to someone just remembering something. That's when people get off from crimes they definitely committed, when all the evidence is just people remembering what happened rather than being able to provide evidence, even in the form of notes or pictures or things which are not collected through more research type methods. It's a very similar kind of principle. And again, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, depending on people's uh, health and availability, uh, we'll be talking more about collecting or formalizing the field notes that we make so that we have better sources of qualitative data rather than just relying on our own memories to be able to collect this kind of data. slight change of pace to starting thinking a little bit about how we 
analyze qualitative and quantitative data. So when we do quantitative analysis, statistical analysis, the kind of questions that we are asking are along the lines of what are the common patterns? What are the trends that we see in the data? If we're looking at means, if we're looking at regression, whatever, something like that. How consistent are these trends and patterns? We think about variability and standard deviation and all of these kind of concepts. Are there any deviations from the trends? We might be thinking in terms of, oh, are we seeing a, a G by E interaction where we're seeing different things in different locations? Are we seeing a, uh, any patterns which are too variable to be able to conclude that there is a real pattern there? Are we finding subgroups where we have different patterns? Do we see different things for men to women when we do an analysis of a survey? Are there any extreme observations, odd observations, outlier observations? What kind of relationships can we determine? Do we have any evidence of causality going through it? If we're trying to look at whether it was a, the using the new variety which led to higher yields and build a regression model and all of this kind of stuff. Doing qualitative analysis is, is exactly the same, except instead of using statistics and numbers we are using a combination of picking out key themes from text or from pictures or from videos or from recordings and doing this cohesive analysis of what trends do we see coming through what are the important patterns coming through are we seeing the same thing consistently in all of the discussions that we're having are we seeing that men that we've spoken to are saying different things to women that we've spoken to? Are we seeing that the results in the north of the country are to, uh, people in the north are telling us very different things to people in the south? Were there any strange observations or strange comments that we weren't expecting to come across? Are people talking about how one thing might lead to another? All of the questions that we ask in quantitative analysis are the same questions that we ask in qualitative analysis except the methods that we use to assess them are slightly different. And again, this is a topic that we will be coming on to in the next few weeks. But again, we don't, fit, feel, we don't think of qualitative analysis as being subjective or inferior to quantitative analysis in terms of what it can tell us. It's just using different methodologies and it's helping us to pull out slightly different pieces of information. Quantitative analysis is strongest at quantifying things, telling us how much things have changed and whether these changes are statistically significant. Qualitative analysis might help us to bring out more things like why things have changed or why things haven't changed, which can't be determined so clearly from a quantitative analysis. Both of them deal with what and how, but there are certain questions which quantitative analysis is better at doing, like how much, and there are certain questions that qualitative analysis is better at doing, like why. This is an example of a paper which has some qualitative analysis in it. So there are lots of agricultural publications with qualitative analysis included. And this is one from Malawi, where some farmers were interviewed about why they conducted experimentation, why they joined something equivalent to, to a farmer research network, an FRN. Uh, so this is a paper which was published in the Experimental Journal of Agriculture. So it's it's not a soft social science journal. This is a very well regarded experimental agriculture journal. The way that they are presenting the results is they've asked farmers about why they have experimented. And then they've coded their responses into whether they think of this as a proactive form of experimentation, a reactive form of experimentation, an external 
uh, source of motivation or whether they had multiple motivations. So this is the coding. They've gone through uh, over 200 interviews here and coded whether the, the main motivations a farmer mentioned were proactive, reactive, external, or whether it was a mixture. And so proactive means that they, they were interested and they, they wanted to try this something out on their own benefit. Reactive means that maybe something bad happened or some, some changes happened, so they were reacting to a situation and trying to make things better as a result. Uh, external means that basically they were asked by someone, asked by an NGO to participate in an experiment and they thought, why not? So you can see the way that they've presented it in this journal. There's a sentence which is, um, and I can give you a copy or send you a link to this paper if you would like to read this paper. There's a sentence here where they said, okay, 162 times they talked about proactive, reactive times was 65, external 77. So they've put in some numbers about how many people fit into each category. And they've then presented statements from the interviews here to explain, okay, what, what kind of things are they meaning when they say proactive, reactive, external, and multiple? So they've put in direct quotes from the interviews that they had. The numbers at the beginning is, is just a farmer ID code. And I think the first two numbers correspond to a, a particular location. And then the second two numbers refer to a, a farmer was in that location, if I remember correctly. So this is a very qualitative approach, which is you're still using numbers in the qualitative approach to say how many people fit into the proactive, reactive and external category to say, okay, how frequent were each of these categories? but then you're presenting this alongside the direct statements from the farmers. There was an interesting comment that just came through in the uh, chat, which I didn't respond to because I was coming onto it now. So both qualitative and quantitative methods are very complementary for each other. If we have some qualitative methods, do our analysis and interpretation and quantitative methods and do our analysis and interpretation. Some people might see this as a mixed methods approach where we're taking data from two different methodologies. We're doing a, an experiment and we're doing some focus groups and then we're analyzing the results of our experiment and we're writing that up. We're analyzing the results of our focus group and we're writing that up. However, this sort of paradigm that I've drawn here I would call this multiple methods rather than mixed methods because we're keeping everything separate from each other. With mixed methods, we're more trying to combine the two together. We're taking the lessons that we learn from the qualitative and we're taking the lessons that we learn from the quantitative and we're bringing it together into maybe a single analysis, a single inter and a, a combined interpretation. Obviously, we are going to analyze the data sets as such as they are in different ways, but we're going to take the lessons that we learn from the qualitative analysis and the lessons that we learn from the quantitative analysis and triangulate them together. And if we're seeing the same things coming out of both methods, this is providing validity. We're getting triangulation between the two methodologies, or perhaps we're getting conflict between the two methodologies which might help to explain limitations in the quantitative methods or limitations in the qualitative methods. So combining it together is how I would think of it in terms of mixed methods. Lots of people feel much more confident in one side or the other side, the yellow box or the red box, but it's only really by collaborating together that we can really make the most of our data. If we all stay in our own lanes and for me, as a statistician, if I just stay doing statistical analysis and ignoring all the other data, this means I might be overlooking extra ways I could be analyzing the data. I could be overlooking important insights which can help me design other trials in the future coming from the qualitative methods. And equally, if you are just a qualitative researcher, ignoring all the data coming from the quantitative methods means you're not going to be asking the right questions, means you might not be thinking in the right lens for how you want to be analyzing your data. So when we talk about mixed methods, we are talking about mixing the methods. 
we're not talking about just doing some qualitative research and some quantitative research. Um, everyone's staying in their own lanes. We want to be combining the two methodologies together. Okay, I'm almost at the end, so I will keep you for two more minutes, I think, with my stupid example, a good example, I don't know, of what I see of perhaps a very familiar uh, example, maybe, maybe not, of what I think is a very good form of qualitative analysis. So you may be familiar or not with this website, um, rottentomatoes.com. It's one of the most commonly visited uh, websites on the internet for movie reviews. And the way that it presents the data is actually a very good, in my opinion, way of presenting qualitative research methods. So I'll, I'll explain why I've picked this particular movie in a minute. There is a good reason for it. But you can see here, ah, okay, different pieces of information about this particular movie to help you decide, hmm, do I want to go and see it? Do I not want to go and see it? It gives you all of the reviews which have been taken from any source it can find. It searches all over the internet and all over newspapers all around the world to see, ah, did people watch this film? And what did they think about it? Did they like it? And what did they say about it? So again, in the same way as in that previous paper, we've got a percentage for how many people liked it. We've got direct quotes. In this case, because there's no issues of anonymity, the direct quotes are attributed to particular people. We can click on those people and see where they came from and understand, ah, this person is from a, a similar background to myself and has similar interests to me. Maybe I'll like it, maybe I won't like it. And we can see the positive and we can see the negative. So in some cases there are negative reviews here or negative comments. In some cases there are positive comments. So it's giving you the full balance of what is coming from this particular reviews of this movie. This approach, I think, contrasts quite nicely with if you were to just look at the poster. If you just look at the poster for the movie, you would only get the positive reviews. It would only tell you five stars from somebody or other and all the awards that it's been nominated for and won. You never see a negative review on a movie poster. So it's often quite tempting with qualitative research to just pick out the positive comments, the comments which are confirming all of our, our biases and confirming all of the things that we want to show. That is as unethical as just deleting the observations from our experiment, which we don't like. So when we're doing our experiment, we know when we come to do our analysis of variance, we shouldn't take out all the values with low yields for the varieties that we like. I think everybody realizes that would be wrong. But for some reason, when people come to present results of qualitative research, they think, ah, okay, we've done some focus groups. Let's just find all the positive comments and put them in. We need to have the balance of when people are saying positive things, what are they saying? When people are saying negative things, what are they saying? How many people are saying positive things? How many people are saying negative things? We need to have that balance in there, otherwise we are just cherry picking our results and we're just using the data to confirm our own prejudices and confirm our own biases rather than actually using it for research purposes. And so I think this website does this in a very nice way and it stands in quite a nice contrast to the movie poster or the promotional material from the, uh, the studio itself. If you are looking for a movie about mixed methods research, I strongly recommend this film. This is the best film ever made about doing mixed methods research. Uh, it's about aliens invading the earth, but in communicating with the aliens, you have a quantitative researcher and a qualitative researcher who are only able to speak to the aliens through collaborating together. So it's a very good film about mixed methods research. If you are, you have my permission to watch two hours of this film as an excuse for, um, for doing your own work. Okay, that was my stupid example to finish off. And hopefully I haven't overrun by too long. Apologies that we were a little bit late starting. Over the next couple of weeks, 
we will be going into more detail about various topics. This was just a bit of an overview of what do we mean by qualitative research and especially within the context of CCRP. So we're going to be focusing much more on the more interesting sorts of qualitative research to do with um, focus groups, to do with getting free form open ended pictures and data from uh, field notes and all this kind of stuff. If you are only familiar with qualitative data as the kind of stuff you collect in surveys, that's fine. Um, you can still think of that as qualitative data, but that is not going to be the main focus that we are interested here because the way that you collect that data and the way that you analyze that data is, as I say, very similar to the way that you would analyze quantitative data.